Welcome back, everyone. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start our third session by introducing our speakers. Our first speaker this afternoon is Richard Meyer. Richard is Robert and Ruth Halperin Professor in Art History at Stanford University and author of the prize-winning Outlaw Representation, Censorship and Homosexuality in 20th Century American Art. Last year, he published two books, just to make the rest of us feel inadequate. What was contemporary art? Um, a history of the idea of contemporary art in the US during the early 20th century and art and queer culture, a survey focusing on visual art and non-normative sexuality from the late 19th century to the present, to the present, co-edited with Catherine Lord. And many of you here are probably familiar with the exhibition he curated at MOCA in 2011, Naked Hollywood, Ouija in Los Angeles. Following Richard, Jim Coddington and Jennifer Hickey will give a joint presentation. Jim is the Agnes Gund Chief Conservator at the Museum of Modern Art, Prior to arriving at MoMA in 1987, he worked at the Metropolitan Museum. His publications include studies of the materials and techniques of de Kooning, Pollock, Miro, and others in MoMA's collection, as well as research on new imaging techniques for conservation studies. Jennifer Hickey is the William R. Leisher Fellow in Conservation at the National Gallery of Art. She is a 2011 graduate of the Conservation Center of the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, where she specialized in the examination and treatment of modern and contemporary paintings. After completing her studies, Jennifer worked at the Museum of Modern Art's Jackson Pollock Conservation Project, which she'll be discussing this afternoon. And our third talk this, in this session will be presented by Megan Luke, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Art History at the University of Southern California. Prior to appointment at USC, she was the Harper Schmidt Fellow in the Art History Department at the University of Chicago. Her book, Kurt Schwitter's Space Image Exile, was just published in February, and she is currently co-authoring a book with Sarah Hamill on the photography of sculpture with support from the ACLS. Now I'd like to invite Richard to the podium, and just a reminder, we're gonna follow the same format that we did this morning. We're gonna have the three talks, and then we'll sit together and do a Q&A, okay? Thanks, Aleka and Andrew and everyone who's organized um, this event. It's really nice to speak across the conservator, I don't know, academic art historian divide, um, if, we are, if we are speaking across it um, successfully, which I hope, I think we are. And the exhibition certainly does very effectively. So my paper is called Eight Inch Myth, Pollock's Mural and the Problem of Placement. Some stories will not die. This is the painting. I took this, I snapped this yesterday because I wanted you to, you, for reasons that will become obvious, I wanted you to see it on a wall and specifically on the wall where it now hangs at the Getty. Some stories will not die. Again and again in the art historical literature, we are told that Marcel Duchamp sliced, sliced several inches off of Jackson Pure, Pollock's 1943 mural because it would otherwise have been too long to fit in Peggy Guggenheim's entrance hall, the room for which it was made. Versions of this story variously focus on Pollock's distress at realizing his dimensional mistake, on Duchamp's role as dispa dispassionate problem solver and canvas snipper, or on Pollock's surprisingly docile attitude um, in, in regard to the trimming of his work. Here, in quick succession, I offer several versions of the story, beginning with Guggenheim's own account in her memoir, Out of This Century, Confessions of an Art Addict. This is from the third edition, published in 1979. We had great, and you've, some of you have heard this already from Yvonne this morning, but I'm just gonna reread it. We had great trouble in installing the enormous mural, which was bigger than the wall it was destined for. Pollock tried to do it himself, but not succeeding, he became quite hysterical and went up to my flat and began drinking from all the bottles I had purposely hidden, knowing his great weakness. Finally, Marcel Duchamp and a workman came to the rescue and placed the mural. It looked very fine, but I am sure it needed a much bigger space, which it has today in Iowa. This last reference is to the University of Iowa, to which Guggenheim gave the painting after her move from New York City to Venice in 1947, once she determined that there would not be sufficient room for Pollock's mural in her palazzo. Um, notice that Guggenheim does not specify the cutting down of the painting by any specific length. 
um, though she does acknowledge its confinement within the space of her hallway. Skipping ahead almost 20 years, I offer next Tom Crow's version of the story from his terrific 1996 essay, Fashioning the New York School. Quote, a freedom to manipulate the art for the purposes of display began with the first hanging of Pollock's mural. Duchamp continuing his role as midwife to the enormous canvas by agreeing to supervise its installation in Guggenheim's apartment. When it was discovered that Pollock's measurements had been too long for the actual space by almost half a foot, the French artist took the decision to cut off the excess, and no one complained that the work suffered any violence." End quote. By Crow's estimation, the painting originally outstripped the wall for which it was made by something under six inches, a mistaken measurement on Pollock's part that very variously expands and contracts depending on the narrator of this anecdote. Here, for example, is Deborah Solomon in her 2001 biography of Pollock. Quote, it took the two artists, and she's referring to Marcel Duchamp, and David Hare appears in certain versions of the story as the other cutter um, of the canvas and fellow artist, and he also has a work in the same entryway, which we'll see a version of a mock-up of in a moment. It took the two artists only moments to figure out that the mural was eight inches too long for the designated spot in the hallway. Duchamp asked Pollock a touchy question. Would he mind very much if they cut eight inches off the end of the work? He would not. End quote. Like Crow's telling of the tale, Solomon's story concludes with Pollock accepting the necessary trimming of the painting without protest. Eight inches here or there did not seem to have mattered very much to the artist. To conclude this compendium of anecdotes about Pollock's painting, I offer a patently absurd, if perhaps in some ways inevitable, interpretation of the extra length attributed to the work. And this is from this is the most recent, also of the of the. Uh, of the versions of the anecdote, which is, and this one is really more an interpretation rather than an anecdote. Donald Weigel's 2006 book, Pollock, Veiling the Image, specifies that, quote, the artist escaped childhood uncircumcised, a condition that gave rise, in Weigel's view, to a notion of sexual symbolism in the making and cutting down of mural. Quote, and this is from Weigel's book, a Freudian might find significance in how Pollock accidentally, that's in scare quotes, accidentally made his commission mural too long for an area in Guggenheim's hallway. Surely he knew the correct dimensions. And actually we have documentation that demonstrates that Pollock did know the correct dimensions. However, after his work was completed, the unwanted inches had to be cut off during the installation before it fit the patron's entryway. On the other hand, as Freud might have said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> End quote. <clears throat> as recent scholars have noted, so those are four kind of versions of this story. There are many, many more um, that float throughout, uh, that surface throughout the literature on Pollock, um, the literature definitely on Peggy Guggenheim. And although I haven't found it, I'm imagining in the literature, I haven't found it yet in the literature on Duchamp. Um, as recent scholars have noted, and as the conservation team here at the Getty has definitively established, there is no possibility that the painting has been cut down, since the tacking edge, uh, th that is, the canvas on the margins of the painting used to wrap around the stretcher and, thus at and thereby attach the painting to the stretcher, the, the, the tacking edge of mural remains intact on all four sides. And here I'm showing you, and these, uh, I want these be this beautiful detail is thanks to Laura Rivers and the conservation team here. This, by the way, is right um, here. This is uh, the detail I'm showing you. I'm, I'm just showing you, oh, showing you the tacking edge as this is before conservation at the Getty. This is, one, I believe, one of the tacking edges that had, as it were, migrated uh, into the face, onto the face of the painting. Um, but just to give you a sense of what the tacking edge looks like, and here you could see um, the tacking edge going all the way around, and Laura showed this slide earlier today, so I'm not gonna belabor the point, and it's really not my point, it's their, their, um, dem their demonstration that, that there is no possibility, and I believe that other scholars earlier, maybe Carol Ungari also, um, uh, uh, had, had established that, that um, the tacking edge was, in fact, um, continuous. Yet, so, but that's really not my interest, is not so much in, um, in the factual matter, but rather in the persistence of the story, nevertheless. 
why does why the story of the eight inches persists extends, I think, beyond psychosexual interpretation such as that offered by Weigel. Um, I think that art history in some way needs this tale, in part perhaps because it reminds us, this is the reconstruction of Pollock's mural in the entryway to Peggy Guggenheim's townhouse. Um, this is from Victoria Newhouse's book, Art and the Power of Placement, uh, which is a very interesting book. And, and she has a, several pages on Pollock, on Pollock, a chapter on Pollock, and several pages on the mural. This is the David Hare sculpture, actually very loosely, I think, reimagined, based on the one photograph we have. I'm not sure that that's what the sculpture would have looked like. But in any event, the placement is accurate, I believe. Um, uh, why the story persists, okay. Why does art history keep returning to this tale? In part, perhaps, because it reminds us that works of art spring not only from the creative vision and agency of artists, but also from the willingness of particular patrons to fund that vision, sometimes for specific spaces. Or maybe the story persists because it dramatizes, in a way, the uh, symbolic revenge of Duchamp, of an early 20th century uh, French artist, uh, uh, if we think of Duchamp as a French artist, upon, which I do, upon uh, a, a post-war American artist, um, the revenge of, of anti-optical, proto-conceptual modernism upon an upstart American expressionism. So I think that this Duchamp cutting down of Pollock, um, all happening under the sort of sponsorship of, Guggenheim, of Peggy Guggenheim, that, that there's something appealing art historically about that. I'm not exactly sure what, but I think there's something. And then I think that the persistence of the story perhaps has most to do with the still unresolved relation between abstraction and decoration, between, if you will, the wall and the work in Peggy Guggenheim's entryway. And the, the art historian Nancy Troy has described the anxiety fueled by the charge of decoration among the salon cubists in early 20th century France in terms of an anxiety that the autonomy of painting would be subordinated to the architecture, environment, and decor of a larger space or room. And um, notwithstanding what we heard from, um, from um, Michael Schreak this morning about the necessary autonomy of mural, I think that this anxiety about um, whether a, a, a work of art is in fact autonomous from the space for which it was made and, first, and, and originally installed and envisioned is an ongoing one. And this story of the cutting down of the eight inches to fit that space is in a way a kind of um, a revenge of the wall upon the work, if you will. The projection of the painting as too long... Oh. This is pe this famous photograph by Carger of Peggy Guggenheim, and our, the only, as was said, the only photograph we have of the work um, in situ. Um, and Peggy Guggenheim holds in each arm, as you can see, um, two poodles or dogs, yeah, uh, lap dogs. I think it actually Tom Crow has this line saying, "Who is the poodle in this picture?" Suggesting that perhaps Pollock is. Uh, either drunk or docile, too docile to Peggy Guggenheim's. Um, but um, the projection of the painting as too long echoes a size-related story that preceded the work's installation in Guggenheim's home. According to Lee Krasner, and I quote here from an interview, for that mural, we had to rip out a wall, and here she's referring to this apartment, which Pollock lived, with, lived in with his brother, Charles, and when Charles moved out, Lee Krasner moved in. Um, we had to rip out a wall in our apartment and carry out the plaster in buckets every night. We needed to create a, la a wall large enough to hold the mural, a wall large enough to hold the mural, so we broke down a partition between the, the, between the two rooms. That created a wall long enough for him to get that big mural painting in, on, on. Um, and here is the, uh, 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 a diagrammatic rendering of the painting, and here is the, um, the wall that's been removed in order to allow uh, work on the painting, because not only does the painting have to be able to be uh, extend, but Pollock needs to work on it. So you can see they've, this entire wall was removed um, for the purposes of, uh, of executing the mural. This is before, obviously, its installation. 
And then Krasner also specifies, the mural was a commission from Peggy of a fixed dimension to fit into the hallway, I believe. She specified the dimensions. Note Krasner's clarity about who determined the dimensions of the work. Although pa Pollock would be photographed hauntingly with the blank canvas for, mur for mural, and we've seen that image several times, it was Guggenheim and the measure of the entryway walls in her townhouse that would necessitate the height and impressive width of the work. Indeed, the fact that it was the wall rather than the work which determined the dimensions of the painting. In other words, it wasn't that Pollock was working on this composition and then decided, actually, I need, I need this composition to be wider or I need this composition to be higher. It was the wall um, which um, shaped uh, the dimensions of the work and was a final arbiter on what they would be. The, the fact that this was the case may have played into the trope of Pollock's work, this, the discursive trope, the uh, a rhetorical trope of Pollock's work as wallpaper. And again, we think of, of wallpaper as usually as a flat repeated pattern that is cut down from rolls to suit the confines or dimensions of a wall. Clement Greenberg, for example, who was a huge supporter of Pollock's at this time and a big proponent of mural, Clement Greenberg would later recall of Mural that, quote, people said it just went on and on like glorified wallpaper. I thought it was great. And in Life um, magazine, this is not um, specifically about Mural, I'll return to Mural in a moment, but this is the famous, um, the famous uh, spread from the 1949 Life magazine, so five years after Mural, and a, and, and a work that um, is actually longer, uh, almost as long, it's 18 feet long, um, although much, much less wide than mural that Pollock is standing in front of. And I just wanna read you uh, the caption that's right here. I know you can't make it out, but I'll read it to you. Jackson Pollock, 37, stands moodily next to his most extensive painting, which he called number nine. The picture is only three feet high, but it is 18 feet long and sells for $1,800 or $100 a foot. Critics have wondered why Pollock happened to stop painting when he did. The answer, colon, his studio is only 20 feet long, 22 feet long, I'm sorry. Um, and so here, both the idea of selling the painting by the foot, the way you might a bolt of fabric, or, um, um, uh, or uh, I, don't know, I don't know what else you sell by the foot, <laughs> but, um, uh, I had something written down. Oh, um, like a bolt of fabric or a roll, maybe, I don't know if wallpaper, I don't think it's actually sold by the foot, but anyway, or a roll of wallpaper. Um, but also, the, but again, the ways in which the width of the painting is determined by the room, in this case, the studio, which is obviously a very special kind of room, but nevertheless a room, um, it, it is, I think, Life Magazine or popular culture playing on this idea that Pollock's work may just be decorative, um, um, wall covering. Um, five years after the installation of Pollock's mural in, in Guggenheim's hallway, Life magazine convened a roundtable on modern art. This is a fairly famous 1948 roundtable. Among the works discussed by the participants was Pollock's Cathedral. This is a work about six feet, just under six feet high, three feet wide. Um, in response to Clement Greenberg's judgment of the painting as, quote, one of the best produced in recent years, Aldous Huxley, the author Aldous Huxley, cautioned uh, that, quote, it raises a question of why it stops when it does. The artist could go on forever. I don't know, it seems like a panel for a wallpaper which is repeated indefinitely around. Sir Lee Ashton, who at the time was the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum, was more impressed by the painting, calling it, quote, exquisite in tone and quality. It would make a most enchanting printed silk. But I cannot see why it is called cathedral. And so um, I wanted to just draw your attention to the ways in which Pollock's work, not just mural, although mural, I think, possibly being the first um, to be likened uh, in order to be distanced by Clement Greenberg from wallpaper. Um, but, but this charge of wallpaper or other kinds of printed fabrics, like, like a printed silk, um, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the ways in which in a certain sense 
mural inaugurates this. There it is at the Getty again. Um, and of course, you can now buy, one can now buy printed silks or whatever. I don't know, maybe they're uh, cotton, or, but like ties and um, scarves and so forth. With, um, I don't know if the Getty made these for mural, but certainly um, the, of the kind that Sir Lee Ashton imagined. And this, I think, takes us back to um, the question of Peggy Guggenheim's own interest in using artists, uh, including Pollock, but not but not exclusively Pollock, as to, de to decorate her, um, her townhouse. And I think the larger history of decoration that is a part of modernism and a part of the history of art, but especially within modernism, is often um, erased, suppressed, uh, rejected, and, and this is part of what Nancy Choi's scholarship has been about. Um, and I just wanted to, I wanted to apply that lesson to Peggy Guggenheim on, uh, this is Peggy Guggenheim in Venice, but um, what you're seeing um, is a bed, a so-called bed head, a silver thing, a headboard, that um, it's really more, anyway, it's not exactly a headboard, but it's a silver sculpture by Alexander Calder that uh, Peggy Guggenheim, um, that Peggy Guggenheim, um, commissioned in 1945 when she was still in the townhouse. So it would have first been in the New York townhouse. And unlike Pollock's mural, she did take the bedhead with her to Venice and installed it uh, in her uh, palazzo. And this is how the bedhead is, unfortunately, to my mind. It's just shown against a wall at, at the Guggen, I believe. I have not seen it at, at the, uh, um, at, in Venice. But um, the pictures online of it from the Venice, uh, it's in the Guggenheim, it's in the Peggy Guggenheim collection. So the bedheadedness of it is kind of lost. Um, but I, but, and this is Peggy Guggenheim. Um, wearing Calder's earrings, um, and she said, I am the only woman in the world who wears these enormous mobile earrings. And again, a sort of way in which she's decorating herself as well as her home with the, um, with the work of these artists. And rather than seeing these as embarrassments of, um, or as art historical, as a sort of art historical no man's land or no person's land, I think that we need to take to take them into account as a serious aspect of what coll how collectors interact with artists and um, the ways in which also collectors live with works. And I thought maybe that, that would be a way to finish is by thinking about uh, Peggy Guggenheim's interest in living with this mural. And I think that one reason why it's important to think about the original dimensions is to return to the, live the lived withness of this object, that it, to remember it wasn't always a museum object, whether at the Getty or now it's owned by the University of Iowa, but it was a privately owned work in a, in a rented home. And so one of the questions that I have is just, would, would Peggy Guggenheim actually have ever considered having Pollock paint directly on the wall since it's a rented space? I mean, I don't, I don't know that you can do that. Maybe she would have, but um, it seems fairly audacious. Uh, but in her memoirs, um, Peggy recalls that after the lease was signed on this townhouse, um, she and her housemate, the bisexual writer and filmmaker Kenneth McPherson, quote, spent hours in bars thinking about the decor of our new home. Hours in bars thinking about the decor of our new home. There was a large entrance hall from which you took an elevator, from which an elevator took you upstairs. We were preoccupied for weeks trying to think of fantastic ways of decorating the entrance hall. In spite of the fact that he was politically left wing, Kenneth didn't seem to realize that a certain highly luxurious, pleasure seeking life was over and no longer fits with our times. Fortunately, he was, remember this is 43. Fortunately, he wasn't serious about anything he suggested for the hall. So instead, and with his permission, I got Jackson Pollock to paint a mural 23 feet wide, so two, she's getting it, anyway, the dimension's wrong, and six feet high, too, too small, too short. Uh, Marcel Duchamp said he should put, we should put it on canvas, otherwise it would have to be abandoned when I left the apartment. That was a splendid idea, and, uh, and for the University of Iowa, a most fortunate one. I gave it to them when I left America. It now hangs there in the student's dining hall. It didn't actually hang in the dining hall from our colleagues at the University of Iowa. It hung in the library where someone was eating a sandwich, apparently, when, when the thing was photographed, and <laughs> Peggy Guggenheim thought that it was the dining hall. Um, and ac according to Tom Crow, um, so she gets the dimensions wrong, too wide, not high enough, and the placement at University of Iowa is inaccurate. What is most important, however, is the care with which she and McPhe with, 
the care which she and McPherson lavish on the decoration of their shared entryway, not to mention the differing tastes that they displayed. And I'm, I won't read this quote because I think I'm running short on time, but um, Peggy, goes, Peggy Guggenheim goes on to talk about how she really liked the mural, but Kenneth loathed the mural, and actually he would not allow her to, she had set up special lights for the mural, um, and he would, said that they would blow the fuse box, and he, she could never turn them on. So she would sneak down to the entryway and turn on the lights so that she could enjoy the mural um, against his, um, against the force of his will, of, of her housemates' preferences. Um, and just to say briefly, um, I just wanted you to notice how uncomfortably close the, uh, both, Paul, uh, both uh, Pollock and especially Guggenheim appear to the painting in this one photograph that we have. And as Angelica Rudenstein has suggested, this is probably because the photograph was as much about the hair sculpture. There was apparently a hair exhibition, at the, a David Hare exhibition at the time. Um, and it would have, in fact, been possible had the, had the photographer, which was this man, Carger, not been... Not, uh, been constrained by the fact that he wanted to photograph Peggy and uh, Peggy Guggenheim and Pollock through the contours of the carger, of the uh, hair sculpture, which was in the corner of the room, um, and they they would there was thir there was 13 feet width, which is not not nothing. Um, uh, so you could actually have moved much further back. But here on the right is a photograph that we might take to be more indicative of how Pollock at least would have liked the the painting to be seen, where you can take in the entire width and the entire height of the thing. Um, without, and, and, and Pollock is, is not, is not uh, casting a shadow on its surface. Um, this is, um, so I'm gonna conclude just very briefly with, um, with, uh, with, this, uh, with the fact that the painting goes to the University of Iowa after Peggy Guggenheim leaves for, um, for Venice, and this is one of the, very shortly after, this is 1952, and one of the things I'm interested in with this paint, with this uh, image is that clearly the photographer is not so focused on mural. He does not, or the photographer does not even bother to get mural entirely in frame. Um, it's a really a picture of the art students, and you see many, many other works, all of which are easel paintings, um, and I think many, many if not all of which are probably student works, and you also see many of the works that the students are um, uh, working on, all of which are figurative. Um, and so apparently, again, according to our colleagues at the University of Iowa, who are some of whom are here, including the director of the museum, um, the students were not particularly interested in the way that, do, uh, in the way that Pollock was painting. And there, this painting was not for them, even though it's hanging in the art studios, a kind of model. Um, what was more of a model, this is a photograph of Grant Wood. There's Grant Wood teaching. Uh, in the mural studios, um, this this building apparently later became the library, which is which is where mural hung. So actually, this very building is the future home of mural. And this is, in fact, the mural I believe um, that uh, you're seeing here um, being worked on by Grantwood. This is 1940. So actually, not an, only three years before mural it was painted, but obviously a completely different idea of what an American mural and what a mural painting would be. And it is, to go back to Tom Crow, um, Tom Crow, according, says that the painting is called mural because that is what its patron conceived it to be, um, which I think is an interesting, if true, an interesting um, idea that the painting would be a mural, although again, a very, a very um, iconoclastic mural in the context of Grant Wood and other regionalist visions of what mural, American mural practice would be. Um, and finally, I would say that reuniting Pollock's mural with the various rooms in which it has, uh, which it has inhabited, and I have shown you, shown it to you in Peggy Guggenheim's townhouse and in the mural and in the art studios at the University of Iowa, among other places, helps us to see the ways in which art constitutes a part of the architecture of life. We will never be able to appreciate all that modernism meant and all that it might still mean unless we are willing to visit the different rooms in which it has dwelled. Thank you. I'd like to join everyone in thanking all at the Getty for organizing such a great uh, event. Um, concurrent with the conservation of mural here at the Getty, Jim and I spent 18 months working together on treatment of three Pollock paintings in the Museum of Modern Arts collection. I'd like first to review the project, to step through each painting's state of preservation, and the treatment decisions that we made in each case, 
and then we'll shift the discussion to that of treatment legacy, considering these three restorations and the restoration of one number 31, 1950 in particular, in terms of the changing aesthetic priorities and value systems that we, as contemporary viewers, impose upon a work of art and that really drive our interventions as conservators. The Pollock retrospective at MoMA in 1998 offered a rare chance to view many of Pollock's masterworks in the same physical space, to compare works created in close succession, as well as those spanning the artist's entire career. The event facilitated the visceral experience, scrutiny, and direct visual comparisons of paintings that exhibitions uniquely offer us. All the nuances of paint handling, color, and texture, not to mention the reality of scale, were readily accessible for examination. Additionally, and particularly germane to our project, conservators were able to assess and compare the states of, of each painting's preservation. Concerning three of MoMA's important works, they noticed patterns of degradation that had begun to assert themselves visually, subverting the original aesthetic balance in varying degrees. These observations laid the groundwork for the treatment campaign that I'll discuss this afternoon, the study and restoration of three large-scale paintings on unprimed canvas. Number 1A, 1948, 1, number 31, 1950, and Echo, number 25, 1951. The three paintings share several technical similarities. One can see that they all post-date any sort of underlying easel painting technique. They're all rather large in scale, and the exposed canvas support is integral to each composition. By this time, Pollock is using industrially manufactured house paints almost exclusively. The number 1A, the earliest of the three works, could be considered more transitional, made using both house paints and oil, artist oils. These shared material and technical features provided a useful foundation for comparison as we ex assessed each painting. All three paintings exhibited uneven discoloration of the canvas. Structural issues and questions about the paint layer also come into play. However, as is invariably the case when dealing with complex objects that have singular histories, each presented its own questions and challenges. In the interest of time, I'd like to get directly into the project and consider the condition issues as they relate to our approach to treatment. Of the three, we chose to treat Echo first because it's comparatively pared down in terms of construction and straightforward in its treatment history. Painted in 1951, Echo is one of a series of so-called black and white works, all composed using black enamel house paints and relying compositionally on significant regions of exposed canvas to establish a figure in ground. Beyond dusting, Echo doesn't appear to have been treated in the past, and we uncovered no documentation to counter this assessment. Our primary concern with Echo was the visually disparate degradation of the canvas support. The canvas is differentially degraded darker and more deeply yellowed along the top of the painting and tapering off to an even straw color about a fifth of the way down. The problem appears to stem from prior installation conditions. The painting hung for many years in a private residence and later on display in the museum's former building. In both installation scenarios, the top of the canvas was very close to the lighting fixtures that illuminated it and it seems likely that the directed heat and light exposure has contributed to the differential discoloration across the top of the painting. Our first step in treating Echo was to dry clean. We dusted the entire surface, first using soft bristle brushes to remove superficial debris, and then using stiffer brushes on the exposed canvas to dislodge more tightly bound dust particles. The painting brightened appreciably with dusting, but the differential discoloration remained. We tested a variety of common methods, both dry and aqueous, aimed at reducing it. While further dry cleaning produced negligible change, fortunately the darker degradation products proved to be easily solubilized in water. Using light moisture applied with swabs and immediately wicked with blotter, we found we were able to locally reduce discolorations along the top of the canvas with a satisfying degree of control and without creating perceptible tide lines. We chose to apply this method only in the most significantly discolored areas, bringing the top portion of the picture into balance with the straw-colored majority, retaining a certain degree of overall yellowing indicative of the painting's age. In addition to the discoloration, Echo's stretcher, likely its original support, tended to both torque when handled and to slightly bow away from the wall when hung, as you can see in the image on the left, so we modified it to prevent this. The addition of keyable aluminum stabilization plates at the corners, 
keys, and an insert backing greatly reduced the torque of the stretcher and provided necessary support to the canvas. We removed the painting from the stretcher and attached an inert isolating layer of marble seal, which is a thin aluminized nylon and polyethylene sheet, to the faces of the wood support as a way of preventing migration of acids from the unsealed stretcher to the canvas and causing further discoloration. In general, I think of echo as the most straightforward of the three treatments, but that may be a deceptive way to categorize it given the variety of courses our treatment might have taken. I certainly welcome further discussion of all three works, but in the interest of time, I'm going to continue on to treatment of number 1A, 1948. Restoration of number 1A was strategically quite different from Echo from the onset, as its condition was complicated by significant damage it incurred during a fire at the museum in 1958. The painting was hanging in a stairwell adjacent to the site of the fire and was exposed to considerable heat and smoke. It was coated in a heavy layer of soot and conservators convened to discuss approaches to treatment. The artwork's industrial house paint and exposed canvas were unfamiliar terrain for paintings conservators at the time, but it was clear that without intervention, the painting would remain in unexhibitable condition. According to treatment records, conservators washed the canvas to remove soot and used a solution of chloramine T, a bleaching agent commonly used in paper conservation at the time, to locally reduce dark staining. Among their treatment notes, conservators expressed their understanding that evidence of the treatment might become visible as the painting aged, and this seems to be the case. Areas of blotchy discoloration have slowly become apparent over the intervening 55 years. The original stretcher, a slim wood strainer, was jettisoned at the time of the treatment and replaced with a heavy-duty expansion bolt stretcher, twice the depth of the original. When the treatment was undertaken, this was common conservation practice at the Museum of Modern Art. Conservators considered lining the painting, as it was also a typical preservation measure at that time, but balked at the idea of potentially causing significant and irreversible visual change to the exposed canvas by infusing it with an adhesive. They chose instead to mount the painting over a loose lining, a second canvas that rests behind the original to provide support, but is not adhered to it. For our present work, it quickly became evident that any aqueous treatment to try to reduce the canvas discoloration would require access to the reverse of the painting. We therefore chose to remove the painting from its current stretcher and to mount it without a loose lining to a working strainer. The discoloration we saw in number 1A responded very differently than that observed in Echo. Dark, patchy stains proved to be insoluble, and other areas were made noticeably light and cool as the majority of the canvas had yellowed. After extensive testing, with limited success, we chose to reduce the most distracting discolorations by retouching with a combination of cellulose and pastel powders. Not a permanent or ideal fix by any means, but readily retreatable. As I noted earlier, the paint layer on number 1A is a combination of artist oil paints and house paints. The artist oils have become very brittle, leading to losses to the impasto, especially at the edges of the composition. And in addition to the airborne dirt of the past half century, the white and cream-colored paints in particular had a dingy gray cast. They appeared to retain embedded soot from the fire. We chose to, com we chose to clean the paint surface and fill losses to the impasto with the intention of restoring a freshness of color and compositional unity. Records of prior treatment indicated that the paint surface had been cleaned with water only. In removing grime from the paint layer, we found that the addition of a chelating agent to our cleaning solution satisfactorily reduced the remaining soot and other more recently deposited dirt and grime. We were able to locate a relatively clear black and white photograph of the painting predating the fire, and that functioned as a guide for the reconstruction of the lost impasto. And I must say that after the challenging, often only marginally satisfying treatment of the canvas, Tossing out and carving skeins of acrylic medium for fills was quite fun. We chose a new, less deep support for the canvas, a stretcher that would more accurately reflect the painting's original depth. And in lieu of replacing any interleaf support, like the loose lining, we had the stretcher constructed with a removable fiberglass insert panel, thereby allowing for future access to the reverse of the painting. 
And I'd like to add too, apropos of this current exhibition's focus on Pollock's engagement with painting as mural, returning number 1A to a slim stretcher does substantially alter its relationship to the wall. A PowerPoint slide, of course, is useless for capturing this, but visually the painting now recedes more seamlessly into the architecture around it. And given its relatively modest size in comparison to a painting like Mural or One, that subtlety of depth makes a difference. You'll have to stop by MoMA and have a look when you're next in New York. In general, I admit that I continue to feel stymied by the complications of number 1A, that the level of restoration I'd hoped to achieve was only a partial success. In the end, however, the painting's current appearance is bound to its history of damage. Acceptance of our limitations as restorers is an ever humbling reminder that the artwork ultimately guides our project. Study and restoration of one required by far the greatest amount of time, partly due to its sheer size. At nearly nine by 18 feet, the painting has a lot of surface area to cover. As one can imagine, one's grasp of a painting of this size and intricacy develops over time. The paint handling and resulting surface sheen are complex. The variation in paint body, its thickness of application, and the nature of its layer structure combine in a visually rich display and play of light across the surface. In assessing recurring features across the composition, we interpreted characteristic patterns in Pollock's technique, and several passages of visually incongruous handling began to emerge. Everything about these areas was slightly off. Color, body, sheen, texture, mode of application. In short, they didn't read like Pollock, but rather like restoration. The archival record left us with an incomplete narrative regarding one's treatment history. The painting entered the collection in 1968, having been purchased from a private collector. The lining made it evident that at some point prior to acquisition, it had been treated. A document found in the curatorial file and alluding to a treatment campaign, we hypothesize, refers to this procedure. However, the correspondence offers no specifics, and there's no record of treatment at MoMA beyond dusting and adding a stabilization brace at the reverse. A crucial gap in our timeline was at least partially clarified by a handful of photographs that Jim was able to locate taken by art historian Charles Ryan in Portland, Oregon in 1962. These detailed photos document the painting six years after Pollock's death and prior to the application of the suspected areas of overpaint, demonstrating unambiguously that they were not added by Pollock. Visually, the thick paint appeared to be covering lifted cracks, and the condition of the paint layer observed in the 1962 photograph supported this hypothesis. But if the retouching were instead filling large losses to the paint layer, its removal would require a substantial campaign of reconstruction, and such a scenario might create a stronger argument to leave the retouching in place. The passages of restoration, one can see here, while isolated, were numerous and in total covered a significant portion of the painted canvas. We x-rayed several of these areas and consistently found cracking but no evidence of fills. In fact, we observed continuous tendrils of paint that extended beneath the restoration, confirming that the retouching covered substantial portions of Pollock's intact composition. Ultraviolet examination was helpful in mapping the material differences between restoration and original paint across the entire composition, and multispectral infrared imaging conducted by John Delaney of the National Gallery of Art provided quite precisely rendered results in the detail areas that he captured. MoMA conservation scientist Chris McGlinchey used X-ray fluorescent spectrometry to identify pigments, pigment disparities between visually similar hues, and discrete samples were identified using Fourier transform infra infrared spectroscopy with consistent findings. The areas of paint that appeared to match our understanding of Pollock's process were identified consistently as alkyd, while the suspected retouching was found to be primarily composed of polyvinyl acetate. The analytical work substantiated our visual assessment, and it was essential for material characterization and differentiation between restoration and Pollux paint. At the same time, it helped us to develop a cleaning solution that would specifically target the PVA over paint. With all of this in hand, we consulted with MoMA curators who concurred with the decision to remove these overpaints, and we therefore proceeded to do so. The cracking we revealed, while at times deep and separated, was stable. The most distracting of these cracks, primarily located near eye level in the composition, already contained a white fill material. We leveled these fills and discreetly retouched them. 
but we left the majority of the cracks exposed because we felt that they didn't detract from the visual experience of the broader composition, and they're completely consistent with the aging patterns of other similarly constructed Pollock paintings. The cracks on one number 31 were covered in the mid-1960s, presumably because they were considered to be a disfiguring or at least worrisome product of age. The decision to remove the overpaint regarding it rather than the cracks is problematic, reflects a change in aesthetic priority. We accept the cracking, the signs of age, and value the original details that had been obscured. Before turning this over to Jim, I'd like to mention a challenging aspect of treating 20th century paintings, what's often referred to as modern patina. The problem is one of shifting zeitgeist and aesthetics, and it's analogous to that encountered in old master paintings, considering the, the degree to which something can and should be restored or made to look new. Consensus on 20th century pictures is still very much in flux. The increased articulation of artists' intent, the broad spectrum of those intentions, and the supremely inarticulable feel that a thing should look a certain way all complicate the conservation of modern and contemporary artworks. This disparity of opinion, I believe, is a major factor driving our sense of responsibility to the public as we stepped through our treatments, these specifically, in a series of blog posts to loop the public in and make our case for the decision making in the public treatments. Jim. So I would like to return to the question that uh, Jen has very much um, uh, more, more exhaustively treated than, than I have. The question about the removal of the overpaint slash retouching on uh, this painting. And I do so for two reasons. The first is that it's an example of how we have to unlearn what we think we know about an artist when we are confronted with the physical evidence on the artwork and with the archival record. And then second, to uh, put it, uh, another question that has been uh, in, into that same context, another question that has been gnawing at me since the 98 retrospective, and that is, did Jackson Pollock, in fact, varnish some of his paintings? And if he did so, he was flying very much in the received narrative of modernist painting practice. So as Jen pointed out, uh, we began the examination of this painting. There were visually um, uh, dissimilar areas in the painting uh, that when in fact Susan Lake looked at them, uh, she immediately said, I've seen retouch like that in other Abex paintings, suggesting to us that in fact they were uh, uh, not by Pollock. The ultraviolet examination that you see here uh, identifies areas where the materials of the suspected repaints uh, fluoresce differently, indicating that they are a different material, and uh, further analysis did identify those as a um, uh, polyvinyl acetate, and thus probably not by Pollock. But the clinching evidence for this was, again, as Jen said, uh, the discovery of Charles's photographs from 1962, where, in fact, the uh, overpaint was not there, but was there in 2013, uh, <clears throat> all of which convinced us that we did, in fact, need to take that uh, overpaint off. So it was a combination of uh, close examination, uh, technical analysis, and the archival record that persuaded us to uh, make what is uh, undoubtedly a very substantial uh, uh, intervention on the work. So where does that leave us uh, in the context of the question that uh, I posed, did Jackson Pollock occasionally varnish some of his paintings? Uh, and the question first occurred to me uh, when I found this letter from Jackson Pollock to the, uh, one of MoMA's curators, Dorothy Miller. Uh, it's a letter from April 14th, 1952, and it refers to uh, some paintings that Pollock uh, uh, has in an exhibition that Dorothy Miller had just hung at the museum. And the relevant passage, I don't have the quote here in front of me, unfortunately, but the, basically the relevant passage says, that he would like to come in to give number seven a coat of glue. He thinks it would take some of the wrinkles out of the surface. He could come in the next time and do it off hours. It wouldn't take more than 10 minutes. I, as a conservator, was absolutely flattened when I read that because it is something that makes no sense to us as conservators to apply a coating to an unvarnished painting, thus uh, skewing the values, uh, the matte and gloss differentials, just to take some wrinkles out. It doesn't make any sense. But to Jackson Pollock, it made every, all the sense in the world. The wrinkles were more important to him. So, in fact, did he undertake that exercise? 
As it happens, number seven, 1949, had been a promised gift to the museum in 1993, came into the museum's collection in 2004, at which point it, of course, immediately came to the conservation studio for examination. And it turns out that he did, in fact, coat the painting. <laughs> Here you see the right-hand part of the picture, uh, and uh, this is, in fact, around the uh, uh, original site size of the painting uh, where it was originally stretched, a previous owner to MoMA had expanded it about six inches. And in the ultraviolet light examination here, you see this is the edge of this milky bluish coating here, stops right here, and the rest of the painting car carries on over there, indicating that in fact Pollock did coat this painting. So we have one painting that Jackson Pollock said he would uh, coat slash varnish, and he did. Are there other paintings? In the mid-1990s, uh, Jay Kruger at the National Gallery undertook the restoration of number seven, 1951. Uh, and in the course of that restoration, he found that in fact Pollock had put uh, a, a second signature on, uh, and that signature was lying on top of a coating that covered the entire picture. Uh, so that becomes a second painting that Pollock uh, applied a coating to. Number 14, 1951, from Tate's collection. Uh, Tom Lerner, while at Tate, uh, undertook some analysis for us at the time of the 98 retrospective. Tom found, in fact, uh, a uh, sizing in, in the uh, canvas, uh, a PVA sizing, but not an overall coating. And this actually conforms to, uh, at least, uh, I'm sorry, going back to the National Gallery picture, that conforms to a, um, a quote from Lee Krasner where she says Pollock would uh, uh, often prepare his surfaces with a coat of rivet glue to harden the surface and that sometimes he would then coat it again after he was done to seal them. So the two people who have the most knowledge of Pollock's working process, Pollock and Krasner, both confirm that in fact the idea of a varnish was not utterly abhorrent to Pollock. But the possibility exists that the coding on number 7, 1949, and as we see from uh, Krasner's testimony and uh, the evidence in the 1951 pictures, that might be a practice that he undertook only after the 1950s and then putting it on to uh, number 7, 1949. It's just really an anachronistic um, uh, step on his part, taking the, his practice from the 50s and putting it on to uh, an earlier painting. However, uh, this painting, number 10, 1949, in the uh, uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts collection, has an overall coating on it. Uh, and Richard Newman there also did some analysis uh, for us at the time of the 90s retrospective and he found an overall coating on this as well uh, but in that case in this case it is a uh, cellulose nitrate coating now again that is not a material that one would expect a conservator use in fact I don't think I've ever confronted a cellulose nitrate coating uh, that a conservator had used but it's a material that Susan Lake has uh, clearly identified as being uh, at least in the paints in Pollock studio and that's possibly in the form of a, a coating material too so while it is not definitive that Pollock coated this painting it seems highly likely that he did so we've now moved the practice back a couple of years from the early 50s to um, quite probably the late 40s. And the final picture that I'll show that is currently under investigation at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Susan uh, very exhaustively went through what all of the paints were here. But one thing that we've recently <clears throat> begun to uh, look at is the possibility that that figurative composition that uh, you see uh, uh, through the whole uh, <laughs> uh, painting here, uh, may well have been coated with a natural resin varnish. Note the date on this is circa 1945. Uh, that would, again, conform to the, uh, a date when a natural resin probably would have been the most likely material for Pollock to use for a coating, and that it may, in fact, coat that uh, entire uh, image underneath, after which he then applied the more abstract um, uh, tube squeezes and pores, et cetera, on the surface that you see. This is ongoing research uh, that we hope to uh, finish sometime in the not too distant future. But in terms of ongoing research now, uh, back to that original question, uh, we have a series of uh, technical analyses, um, uh, close visual examination, and uh, archival records that suggest indeed at times Jackson Pollock did coat his paintings, he varnished them. And it thus leaves open, uh, very open the question that, or, or opens many more questions, I think, that we need to uh, still study and understand about Jackson Pollock's materials and techniques. There's still much to understand, not just in, about those materials and techniques, but why he undertook and used those materials to achieve the aesthetic and the results that he did. Uh, thank you all for listening, and thank you to a whole boatload of people.
I too would like to thank a boatload of people, but I will spare you the Oscar's length speech of all the thank yous that should go out. But I really want to call out the incredible work that Yvonne, Laura, Tom, Alan, Andrew, and Aleka all did, and Jim Cuno for galvanizing us all here today. It's been a real privilege to be part of these conversations. So I'll get right to it. The occasion of the Getty restoration of Jackson Pollock's 1943 mural for Peggy Guggenheim prompts me to revisit what might seem to be well-worn ground in the reception of the artist's work. That is, I want to ask after the identity of his paintings as walls, as images that interrogate what the space of painting and architecture should be. During the course of this project, the Getty team carefully weighed the feasibility, even desirability, of restretching the enormous canvas of mural to correct for a sag that had begun to appear perhaps as early as the very months when Pollock was painting it. These deliberations got at the core of some of the most cherished tenets in art historical evaluations of Pollock's contributions to modern art. And as we saw this morning, you don't see it quite so strongly in the photographs, but really this very distracting sag up here and also at the bottom margins is, is what's at issue. Pollock's abstraction, we are told, eschews the illusion of deep space in favor of an all-over, decentered strategy to composition. The relative relationships of scale among forms within an image are subordinated in turn to the overall scale of the visual field in relation to the beholder's body. The edges of Pollock's large paintings are, therefore, contested terrain. They shape their anti-hierarchical compositions and establish their size, thereby provoking what the, Clem what the critic Clement Greenberg polemically diagnosed as the crisis of the easel picture. The Getty conservators were faced with three alternatives. One, give mural a frame that would mask the exposed tacking margins. Two, replace the rectangular stretcher and leave evidence of the sag visible, tacitly accepting the pseudo frame or background it gave to the composition. Or three, create a subtly shaped stretcher that would restore visually the impression of the painting as extending to its limits. Each option implies a different argument about the identity of mural. As a picture that hangs on a wall, as a picture, as a mural painted on a wall, or an image that is a wall. And to decide among them not only requires that we get a sense of what this work was at its inception, but also what it became as its consequences were refracted through Pollock's subsequent practice. Mural was the largest painting Pollock would ever produce, and precociously so. And I just want to show um, two, two other paintings. It wasn't until 1950 that he would again make paintings that would approach it in sheer size. And to not minimize their size, I put them on two separate slides. Guggenheim commissioned the painting to fill an entire wall in the entrance hall of her apartment building and wanted it installed in time for the opening party for Pollock's first one-man exhibition at her Art of the Century Gallery in November 9, 1943. In July that year, Pollock went to inspect the space and she purchased the canvas, which he stretched himself. Pollock and Lee Krasner had to tear down a wall in their apartment so he could paint mural, the inaugural act of violence against a pre-existing architecture that ultimately made room for a new conception of space that would henceforth dictate his art. Before the first mark was even applied to the broad expanse of canvas, this surface alone would be what determined space, scale, and composition. The relationship of mural to the architecture of both the studio and the townhome signaled that this was a painting that would make space, not conform to it. It would, in other words, contest the idea that space was an enclosed cube, a void existing prior to experience and embodiment, and homogeneously extensible in all directions, simply waiting to be filled and capable of being reliably mapped and partitioned. According to Guggenheim, it was Marcel Duchamp who suggested that mural be painted on a stretched canvas so that she could take it with her in the event that she should move from her rented flat. In 1947, when she made Italy her permanent home, the painting remained behind in New York and became publicly available in the exhibition Large Scale Modern Painting at the Museum of Modern Art, for which it was framed, signed, and dated. 
The photographs taken by Herbert Matter of Pollock standing before the painting show the artist's initial attempt to reconfigure and assess mural as a framed picture. The canvas has been unrolled and tacked very low directly to the wall, its stretcher bars arranged to serve as an impromptu frame. These images appear to offer one answer to the question, what happens to the site-specific work of art when it has lost its sight, when it is made homeless? Mural ceased to be a wall and became a picture that could be hung on any wall, any wall capacious enough to exceed its girth, that is. Matter took these photographs at the studio at Vogue magazine where he worked as a freelancer. Here we see the painting as wall already transformed into a backdrop, a decorative frame for human scale. Yet I want to insist on the space of mural as a wall, and precisely not as an object forever sandwiched between the human and some a priori neutral space that always exceeds and contains it. This space augured an approach to painting first in his large so-called drip paintings from 1947 to 50, and then in his painting on glass that famously challenged the priority of that human scale as the measure of all things in the world. It is, after all, important that we see all four edges of mural in Matter's photographs. This is an encapsulating view explicitly denied by George Carger's unsettling, slightly creepy photograph of it in situ in Guggenheim's foyer. Here we appreciate how carefully Pollock and his patron considered the painting's dimensions to account for the decorative moldings running along the ceiling and the floor. And here I want to thank Angelica Rudenstein for this incredible research she's done into this um, architectural site. Once installed, mural was framed at top and bottom by bands that appear to be of equal width and color. At the same time, research into the length of the painting suggests that no such framing existed for the vertical sides of the picture. Despite the evident care to measure the stretcher for the wall, the painting was slightly too long, and as the conservation team proposes, it was probably restretched and taken in about an inch so that it would extend across from edge to edge. And so these are some of these initial um, nail holes that were then uh, driven into the canvas and about an inch in from the right hand side of the painting to sort of rewrap it in situ when it was being installed. Nothing would check the momentum of the freeze-like composition rushing from right to left, which indicated the vector of one's movement from the entrance into the building to the corridor to the elevator at the back. The half frame provided by the architecture contained the composition much like a tight channel irrigating torrents of water, building up directional energy incapable of being dammed. By cropping the painting in his photograph, Carger respected the difference between Pollock's treatment of Mural's top-bottom edges and its extreme vertical edges, as if to visually affirm that this was an image impossible to contain laterally. Lurking behind the David Hare sculpture, shooting the image under the harsh glare of artificial light, doubling the figures by Caligari-esque shadows that appear to mesh with the undulating marks of paint, he likewise exaggerates the close space of the hallway. Unlike the matter photograph, Carger shows, Carger shows us that a key feature of the painting as wall is that it demands to be seen obliquely. I, for one, can't help but see this photograph as the mirror reflection of the one Bernard Chart took of Pollock standing silhouetted in front of the unpainted canvas after it had been stretched and propped up in his studio. Together, these images show us a painting at opposite extremes of its genesis, the moment just before the first mark and its triumphant validation. As Pollock recalled in an interview in 1950, quote, there was a reviewer a while back who wrote that my pictures didn't have any beginning or any end. He didn't mean it as a compliment, but it was. Here he exploits the temporal as well as spatial significance of beginning and end with which he had used to reckon with the ambiguous identity of mural after it had ceased to be a wall and became a framed picture. After the painting was installed at MoMA, he applied for a Guggenheim Fellowship, quote, to paint large movable pictures which will function between the easel and mural. I believe the time is not yet ripe for a full transition from easel to mural. The pictures I contemplate painting would constitute a halfway state, an attempt to point out the direction of the future without arriving there completely, end quote. 
Mural painting, as Pollock learned, was less an idiom with which he was already familiar, whether through the work of Jose Clemente Orozco, Thomas Hart Benton, or Pablo Picasso. Instead, mural painting would be a force, one held in taut suspension, generating, as he put it, memories arrested in space that pointed to a future possibility they nevertheless held back from fully realizing. If Guernica was, as Francis O'Connor beautifully put it, an exiled mural, Pollock's mural was, to recall the words of El Lizitsky, more like a, quote, interchange station between painting and architecture. Only now, in 1947, for the utopian, dystopian atomic age. For as the poet Frank O'Hara reminds us in his Pollock monograph from 1959, this anticipated yet deferred annihilation is the true horizon of Pollock's large-scale paintings. Quote, it is not surprising that faced with universal destruction as we are told, our art should at last speak with unimpeded force and unveiled honesty to a future which well may be non-existent in a last effort of recognition, which is the justification of being. And I just wanna highlight these spatial words, unimpeded and unveiled for you in this quotation. Mural, as we have seen, did not have a beginning or end, but it certainly had a top and a bottom. At Guggenheim's townhouse, it had been a painting seen from the side, almost out of the corner of one's eyes, on the way to elsewhere. I can imagine that once Mural itself began to travel, Pollock seriously started to consider painting in the round. For his later drip and poured paintings, he encircled the entire perimeter of the canvas as he worked, only rarely stepping into its expanse. And surely deciding on the final orientation of a given work was a key part of his getting acquainted with it as something finished, lifted up off the floor. Further, whereas the space of Mural's composition was directional, shaping the beholder's experience of existing architecture with a specific momentum, the space of the later poured paintings is instead akin to a new kind of architecture, that of the open plan and glass construction. As the architect and MoMA curator Peter Blake put it, quote, I felt there was something about Jackson's work which was totally beyond the kind of framed picture that you hang on a wall or over a fireplace, something that related to the type of architecture my friends and I were interested in. I kept thinking in terms of having him do entire floating walls, possibly outdoors. God knows how they might have been supported. Blake met Pollock through Matter in the summer of 1947. He soon arranged to visit the painter at his studio in the Springs on Long Island, where he had the powerful impression that the, quote, relentlessly horizontal landscape surrounding the house was very much a part of the paintings, end quote. He credited this impression with his proposal to Pollock for an ideal museum of his works. Quote, I'd love to see them floating in that landscape, to see the landscape almost penetrate the paintings, to have a kind of translucent exhibit in which the paintings and the landscape would merge. I said to Jackson, you know, I had an idea that maybe the way to hang these paintings in your landscape would be to set them up between mirrors and have people walk in among the paintings within the endless reflections. He thought about it for a while, because if you do that, of course, you change the painting's dimensions, and you also change the images considerably. And he decided it was really a very interesting idea. It obviously hadn't occurred to him at all, but he said, why don't you go ahead? Let's try it. Blake constructed a model for a 5,000 square foot museum with a translucent roof about 12 feet high from the floor, quote, in which his paintings were suspended between earth and sky. He asked Pollock to make some sculptural models that could serve as, quote, stable elements that would be related to the paintings. They were placed in the model included in Pollock's exhibition at Betty Parsons Gallery in November 1949, which Blake installed. Arthur Dexler, reviewing the model for the magazine Interiors, wrote that in it, the viewer could see that, quote, the project suggests a reintegration of painting and architecture, wherein painting is architecture. Its sole purpose is to heighten our experience of space. The model then ended up back in Pollock's studio, where we see it in some of Rudy Burkhart and Hans Namus photographs of the artist at work and where it eventually fell apart. And so you just see that model sort of in the background of so many of these photographs, many others of which have been on view today. 
The impulse to place Pollock's large-scale paintings between mirrors takes the lateral open-endedness of the Guggenheim mural to new extremes, denying any perception of them as bounded or enclosed. In this environment, the vertical edges of any painting are no longer limits, but become beats of rhythmic reduplication, seams that suture together a modular series that Blake, quote, could only describe as the dream of space, a dream of endless, infinite space in motion. Blake used magazine reproductions of Pollock's paintings for his model, cropping them without any more concern for their actual scale than he had for the practical engineering issues that would realize such a structure. Quote, I didn't particularly care how big the paintings were in reality. I made them any size that seemed to be appropriate for the space. This collage fragmentation of Pollock's works through reproductive media is a key feature of the space that Blake envisioned, a space that the paintings simultaneously inspired and to which they were called upon to conform. Here, Blake makes clear his debt to Mies van der Rohe's plan and photo collage proposal for an ideal museum for a small city, which similarly would have installed paintings on freestanding walls. And so here you see sort of this open uh, floor plan with these freestanding walls that would have had um, just paintings, including Picasso's Guernica, for example, floating in and among these sort of stabilizing elements of sculptures. And these photo collages are also by Mies. Blake explicitly stated that, quote, Jackson and Mies seem to have a very similar attitude toward the nature of space. Blake's model for the ideal museum took its inspiration from the painting's radiating space, which, much like Mies's architecture, had the ambition to extend outward in all directions, in rapport with and beyond their containment by a material support. When Pollock spoke about his paintings as without beginning or end, Krasner had immediately agreed, quote, that's exactly what Jackson's work is, sort of unframed space. And I think this is even clearer in this famous and very inspirational um, floor plan for a brick country house by Mies, where we don't see any kind of enclosing walls, but rather this kind of um, uh, sort of uh, intersecting series of walls that kind of create spaces in and among between them, but it's not enclosed in a kind of envelope. Clearly, I believe a full account of Pollock's work in the wake of the Guggenheim Commission would need to show how it engaged with, contested, and reshaped another more eclectic and diffuse European legacy, apart from that of Picasso and surrealism, namely one that had established space as something other than enclosure. Mies and Lisitsky are key to this history, but so too are others who more directly intersected the Guggenheim circle, like Piet Mondrian, Frederick Kiesler, and Hans Richter. For now, though, it is enough to acknowledge how persistently Pollock pursued plans to realize the full potential of the painting as wall. In 1949, Blake encouraged the architect Marcel Breuer, who, like Mies, was another Bauhaus émigré, to visit the Parsons show, and he introduced him to the painter. Breuer commissioned Pollock to create a wall for a home he had designed in 1945 for Bert and Phyllis Geller in Lawrence, Long Island. It would serve as a partition between the living room and dining room on a bookcase that was specifically designed for it by Pollock's friend, Giorgio Cavallone. And so here are the original plans by Breuer where you see the living room, the dining room. Uh, Pollock's painting would have been here. I think this bookshelf that you also see in these photographs was not the one designed for it. It was existing in the space when the house was um, designed, um, because weirdly enough, there are no photographs of the Pollock in situ, which is itself really quite bizarre. At six by eight feet and painted on board, not canvas, this painting, now in Tehran, expanded significantly upon the potential of the Guggenheim mural's relationship to architecture. And here I'm just showing you what the actual scale is um, from a photograph from when it was last viewed um, outside of Iran in, for an exhibition in Japan. Apart from the size, the other restriction was that the ground color be as similar as possible to that of Arabesque, number 13, 1948, to integrate with the existing color scheme that Breuer had provided when he blocked out the open space using wall color, a de Stael innovation popularized while he was at the Bauhaus. In 1954, Blake upped the ante, designing a small home whose four exterior walls would all be large paintings by Pollock that could slide out into the landscape. 
When closed, this pinwheel house would have created a total Pollock environment. When open, the painting's compositional energy would have exploded out from an interior no longer defined by enclosure, but by the space between the horizons established reciprocally between the paintings and the landscape they confronted. Though Pollock was excited by the idea and would have only charged Blake for the costs of the materials, alas, this expense still proved prohibitive. So the house was built, but you know, the walls were just you know, sort of wood walls. They weren't um, Pollock paintings that um, faced out into space. Although I'm showing here uh, Lavender Mist, um, currently at the National Gallery of Art, which is a painting that Blake also wanted to buy for himself, but at the time he couldn't afford it. Here again, O'Hara articulates what was at stake in a way that, to my mind, Greenberg never quite could. Quote, at one time it was thought that the all-over paintings of Pollock represented an infinitely extendable field, a force which could continue out into all four areas of space surrounding its boundaries. This is true of sight, but his work is not about sight. It is about what we see and about what we can see. So about this horizon for our perception is really what these works are about, is something kind of uh, bounded but not totally um, enclosed in a kind of predetermined uh, way. It's something that I think O'Hara is um, speculating on here. I am ending here, regrettably, right where I feel I should begin, on the threshold of certain big ideas that have haunted this talk. In an underappreciated text from 1950, the poet and critic Parker Tyler argued that the space of Pollock's labyrinthine abstract paintings excluded or exceeded the human scale as the absolute measure of the world. The intricacy of their gestures confronted with the largeness of their fields to cancel out the space where the beholder could believe that his or her role was as a reliable intermediary between this world and infinity. Rather than imaginatively cast oneself into these paintings, Tyler averred that one, quote, recoils from them, however practically, but somehow practically because he does not leave their presence. He clings to them as though to life, as though to a wall on which he hangs with his eyes. And I just love this idea of instead of this immersive feeling of kind of oceanic oneness with these fields of color, um, instead we're just sort of cliffhanging with our eyeballs onto these surfaces. I think that's a kind of really crazy description. The ultimate, perhaps painful work of the painting as wall is, in his account, to decenter perception, to give the beholder, quote, the sight of an image of space in which he does not exist. And here I must ask, in light of Pollock's subsequent painting on glass, does not exist or does not yet exist? This is hard to say any more than it would be to characterize this space definitively as a nightmare or a dream. We have seen that the space of mural in Guggenheim's foyer channeled an energy and lateral expansion that we ought to broach obliquely. The space of the Geller mural and Blake's ideal museum was in turn that of rotation and expansion grounded by the orientation of our bodies and painting's horizon of perceptual possibility through its material conditions, what Pollock called its technic. Perhaps the painter's experiments painting on glass then point to the final frontier, the space of painting approached from behind with the potential to see it in the round and through it be seen. At least this is how I might begin to make sense of Krasner's only memory of Pollock talking about landscape in the context of his own work. One morning before going to the studio when he said, I saw a landscape the likes of which no human being could have seen. Thank you. All right, wow, those were amazing, um, amazing papers. And I, I have a, a couple of comments of my own, but I'd like to first open it up to the audience to begin the conversation. I don't see any hands, amazingly. Okay, down here in the front, could you bring a microphone down? Hi, uh, Todd Behrens. Um, you know, I know mural came sort of at the end of a great period of murals in this country and elsewhere, um, distinguished by the fact that it was a private commission as opposed to a public mural. Are you aware of any other private murals like mural that preceded it? 
Well, <laughs> not being a mural expert, I... I mean, I'm sure there are. It's just, um, you know, in the context of my own work for this talk, I was thinking very much about small private homes done in Europe in the interwar period, right? I don't know if you would call wall painting necessarily always as a mural. The word mural, as we've seen all across the day is a really ambiguous term. It can be this monumental public commission, for the example, with the Mexican muralists or, or Benton, for example. It can be a kind of weird, huge painting like the Picasso's Guernica, which you know is painted on commission, but you know has also had a kind of um, ambiguous architectural sighting over the course of its life. But I was thinking of, say, for example, the Rietveld Schroeder House, where you have huge blocks of color. They're not necessarily compositions. The whole space becomes a composition through wall painting that is a really actually um, uh, a kind of, it's not an, an anti-decorative or decoration as, as an embarrassment actually mm -hmm. for, a, for a long time throughout the sort of 20th century and, and before. There's this idea of, of the decorative being something that can finally make art something that isn't happening always as, at a remove. So it, it would be interesting to kind of research um, big painting commissioned by private patrons who want to live with it. I don't know if Richard, you had had discovered anything more while you were looking into the topic, but um, I, I think it's interesting that that Pollock was not very well known at this point when Peggy Guggenheim um, hired him to do this, and I, so I, I'm thinking that actually I, I don't know that there would be that I, in this country at that time. It seems to me that the murals. I mean. In 40, before 43, the murals that would have been uh, influential or significant would have been public murals, like, and certainly the ones that Pollock knew would have been the Mexican muralists and WPA and Benton and so forth. Um, but I'm sure if one actually scratched the surface a little bit, I mean, one mural, but it's 20 years before, that I'm interested in that I've worked on is the last oil painting that Duchamp ever did was for the bookshelf over mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. the... Um, apartment of Catherine Dreyer. It's a painting called Tuma, um, T-U-M apostrophe. Um, and, uh, and I've written about how that was actually done for a very specific space. And now when one sees it at the Yale University Art Gallery, that space, that wall mm -hmm. are, are, are gone. And it doesn't actually read mm -hmm. as a mural anymore. Right. It just reads as a, as a wide painting. Um, and I just wanted to mention something else that Nancy, Nancy Troy said to me, which was that many, many murals, in fact, probably most WPA murals um, were done uh, on canvas. So the idea, I mean, I had originally thought for, in my mind, a mural is actually on the wall, like a fresco. But it seems to me, uh, or, and from looking at it a little bit more, that, uh, that actually many of these murals were done um, on canvas, um, which was one way in which they could, they could be dispensed with, uh, you know, it, later on if people didn't want to continue to look at them. Or they could be painted in a studio and then, right. you know, installed. So this idea of, like, Michelangelo painting the ceiling in situ is not necessarily one that they're all doing. Or the right. slide of Grant Wood working in the library space, I think, is actually quite unusual a little bit. But it is interesting in the sort of... Well, that's, um, he's te that's a, yeah. a teaching space exactly. for students to do, learn how to do murals. And the, um, the sort of, but fresco is being used by, the, uh, by Orozco and tempera on canvas, mm -hmm. which is a sort of still old master-ish kind of revival on the part of Benton, who, you know, Erica will speak more, I'm sure, eloquently about this. Um, you know, th that it's interesting that it's oil on canvas, which could be already a kind of, you know, a peripatetic or sort of medium, so, yeah. Any other? There's a, over here on the side. Hi, thank you. Um, that was really great, very interesting. Um, Megan, so I actually had a question for you. Hi. I'm, oh, there you are. It's Mackenzie, okay, over here. Yeah, it's like I hear a voice. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm in the distance. Huh. Um, I was actually curious about the role of photography mm -hmm. in um, sort of framing, um, for example, the picture that you showed us of Pollock, the two different pictures of him in front of Mural. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting that he's pictured in front of the painting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of wondering what you make of that and kind of the photographer's role in actually sort of you know, giving us a representation of these works. Um, and it seems very telling to me that he's not only in these photographs, but he's sort of one with the painting in mm -hmm. a sense. He's mm -hmm. sort of 
surrounded by the painting on all sides. Yeah. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that immediately struck me as I was looking at photographs of Mural and Pollock is how weird they are as photographs, right? The only photograph we have of it in situ, and it's not like photography's a new invention in 1943, you know? Right. I mean, it's like right. we have this one bizarre paint picture, right? This photograph by Carger of, you know, Peggy Guggenheim standing with her dogs. And, you know, Angelica Rudenstein yesterday was saying, you know, maybe this is more of a photograph about the sculpture. And I'm like, mm -hmm. even so, it's still a weird photograph of a sculpture. The sculpture is kind of blurry. It's not completely in the frame, right? There's this weird way in which the works seem deliberately incomplete or incapable of being contained by the aperture of the camera. So that's one hand. So I've been focusing in the, in the talk about sort of the way the works are framed, but certainly there's already this treatment of these works works as backdrops, right? So the works, we've been talking a lot about the works um, being framed by architecture, then being framed by frames, exhibition frames being made for them, but these works themselves are frames for people to pose in front of, and I think that's part of Tom Crow's really seminal essay mm -hmm. about looking at the Vogue photographs, for example, and taking them quite seriously as this idea of a, of a decorative backdrop. But um, in a lot of the writing on Pollock's work, there is a kind of uneasiness about the scale of these works as necessarily being defined by the human, right? There's a way in which human beings are courted to immerse themselves into it, but they are deliberately alienating, right? Like some of the quotations I've provided suggest that um, their sheer scale was actually quite overpowering. So I'm really curious about the role of photography as a kind of disciplinary agent, you know, in terms of trying to make sense to control this sort of seeming wildness of scale, but also one that acknowledges its own limitations in the face of it, right? The anxiety that these, these photographs seem to perform are also ones that we are meant to feel, too. And in, a lot, in that relationship, too, I thought it was fascinating to think of the role of photographic reproduction in the making of the model for the Blake, right? The idea that you could cut and paste and collage a space, and that these mirrors and these reflective surfaces in this space imagined perfectly for Pollock encourage a kind of reduplication of form that we already see in mural, right, with these sort of repeating frieze-like figures, right? It's almost as if um, by using photography to reinterpret um, Pollock's work in this way is taking certain compositional cues of reduplication and repetition that's starting to appear around the time of the making of this work. So, you know, it's a great question and it's one that I think is intimately related to the, to the history of painting as well, so. Great, I, I know, okay, great, now all the hands are going up. <laughs> George. Um, I wish I had a question for the conservators um, because I was really, um, really fascinated by the varnish question. That's not a question though, and I do have a question for the art historians again. Um, <laughs> for both Richard and for Megan, something that I, I wanted to ask you something different, um, two questions then, that maybe was left out of both talks, although Megan started to answer just now what I was about to ask. Um, for Richard, the, the eight inch myth um, and the psychosexual dynamics that you explored a little bit with the different stories that are told of the cutting, cut, supposed cutting of the canvas. Um, it just made me think about the, the gender of Peggy Guggenheim um, as a woman, as, a, as the collector. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how to deal that into the dynamics that you were tracing about decoration and why that story gets told over and over again that she was a woman. So that's the question I wanted to ask Richard. Um, and Megan, I just wanted to ask you, but you've already started to answer it. Um, this paper about space, I just, it was incredible. It was fantastic. Um, but what I didn't sense in it was an account of what happens internally within yeah. Mural yeah. and what that would do to your ideas about Pollock and space, which you've started to, to answer. Cut. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> that would be the part I would add. Like that's the part that got cut in the interest of time, but absolutely, I'm right there with you. So maybe Richard, you can go for it. Um, yeah, I do. I, I don't. I, I haven't really worked out, a, you know, a full answer, but um, to this question or thought. But I, I do. I am actually intrigued by the fact that all the stories, or many, uh, all, all the stories that include the turn where at the end, where Pollock is asked if he minds if the eight inches are cut, um, include this idea that he he doesn't. That it's all this, you know, that it's fine with him, and, and that he's just sort of relieved that. The, so, which seems to me a kind of subservient role or, or a kind of, um, that if, and I, but it also seems to me that if, if he doesn't mind is that maybe that one reason why is because he, 
grants that the wall is what Matt, like fitting it onto the wall. I mean, no one suggests, for example, doing what they did at his apartment, which is cutting a wall down in Peggy Goon, or doing something to actually change the architecture. So th this seems to me actually subtly gendered, more explicitly gendered, but complicatedly so, is the fact that Peggy is involved with Kenneth McPherson, who's this, and both, both of them are also, I believe, involved with multiple other partners. Um, so sexuality in that space, that, that's why he actually has the third and fourth floor, or the fourth, um, Angelica, you say, I, she has two floors of the, of the townhouse and he has a floor. I just remember that she says she has four bathrooms and he only has one. Oh, so. But then there's a Regency staircase, she said, between his space and her. But, so does she live on four and he, because she says I have three bathrooms and he has one. But, okay, but <laughs> in any event, it seems clear that like there was enough distance so that they could both have other liaisons. And I think that um, like gender is, de and then you have Duchamp, I mean, a as a sort of advisor, um, and you, you know, gender and desire, it seems to me are fairly, uh, volat you know, fairly in flux, fairly, uh, pretty much in flux. And I think that that's also interesting in relation to a mural that on the one hand could be read as pretty and sort of feminized, like in terms of all the pinks. I, by the way, wore this pink shirt to, uh, to, to be matchy, matchy with the f uh, black. But in any event, um, on, and on the other could be seen as totally, I mean, in, in, in light of Pacifay or something, as totally about volatility and violence and, and, and kind of um, no rest from a, 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 a kind of world of, of um, conflict. So I, I, I don't have an answer other than that I think it's interesting that in, in these anecdotes, Pollock, is, his, his work is not only snipped, but his, he seems to have almost no agency in terms of either solving the problem of being too wide, too big, or, um, or protesting against the, ans the solution of of the cut. Um, I just wanted to also, just to quickly follow up on George's question, in the, conserv the Getty team has a wonderful line in their essay for the catalog, um, just again, plug the catalog, which is so useful, um, where they talk about how the way the vertical forms approach the edge, they seem to almost bounce back as if by reflection. And I don't know who specifically those words were, but I love them. Because I love this idea of the edges being almost mirrors before they're mirrors or something. Something about the energy of these strokes and the composition kind of always broaching the edge. And I think about this when I look at the MoMA paintings, where there's a sense in which Pollock has an almost Matissean sense of the feeling Field, you can almost sense him kind of getting a bodily dimension of it even before a mark is put down of a kind of zone that he almost intuitively knows. So the edge is there. It's just not absolute. It's something to be kind of dialectically overcome and rehearsed. Um, and then it's interesting, Richard, just in terms of this question of gender, is I've been thinking a lot about Parker Tyler and Frank O'Hara, the two queer men who are really engaging with Pollock. And I think they actually, if you really read those texts carefully, they offer a very different Pollock than, say, somebody than Greenberg and Rosenberg with this kind of masculinist rhetoric of, of kind of power and certainty. And so I think there's a lot there to think about that it strikes me that your your paper is about a historiographic question of how, how this becomes a metaphor for how we um, have certain attitudes of the stories that we cherish. And it might not have anything to do with the, the material of the work, but it's more about how these things sort of demand, um, you know, our, why we need, feel we need these kinds of stories. Yeah, it's like a different. And I, I know we have a couple more questions in the audience, but I actually did want to take the opportunity to myself to ask a question of the conservators. Um, Jennifer, I really appreciated the point that you made, made about acknowledging the aging process of these paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, I think a lot of the conversation um, over the last few days has been thinking about kind of getting back to some like original object and that state. And so I, I appreciate that kind of factoring that in. Um, but then, Jim, I wanted to ask you about the, the varnish and if there's, if there's any logic to why those particular objects were varnished and others weren't, or if you have any hypothesis about that. Uh, I don't, uh, or it, it would be so incompletely formed at this point that uh, uh, it would be just misinformation to uh, uh, put it out. Uh, that's why I ended with this is something that I think needs um, uh, considerably, considerable more research. 
principally because, uh, as I said at the beginning, it flies in the face of the received uh, narrative of modern painting practice of uh, the unvarnished surface. And I think that uh, I, that also needs to be understood in terms of the profound aesthetic consequences of it or the lack of interest in those aesthetic consequences mm -hmm. by uh, Pollock. So I would just say it's, uh, I, I, I want to uh, get it out there so that people yeah will uh, help me understand it because I, mean, I don't yet. I also think it's just interesting in the, from the perspective of a later intervention into a supposedly <laughs> yeah. complete and finished object that's already out there circulating and being yeah. consumed whether by the market yeah. or by a museum. Um, or the well, I, I suppose one thing that I should absolutely um, say that I've thought about is that this does not give everybody license to go out and uh, <laughs> varnish on varnished polyps. Yeah. You know, that's a choice that he made. He did not varnish it, but yeah. there may be some varnishes that in fact are original. Okay. Um, Nancy, there's a, right here in the middle. We're a duo here, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just want to correct one tiny misinterpretation, um, and it was undoubtedly my fault. I never thought that that paint, the, the, the cargo photograph was of the sculpture. Oh, okay, sorry. What, I, sorry. what I said, what I'd hoped to say, and forgive me for misinterpreting the issue, was that it, we have to entertain the possibility that because David Hare had an exhibition going on at Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century, David Hare and Pollock were friends, David Hare and Peggy were friends, it's possible that that photograph was intended, intentionally slanted in order to take in the sculpture, yeah. Oh, yeah. mural, Peggy and Pollock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we and, have to entertain that possibility. And that, absolutely, that was what I intended. yeah, and I think that there's a way in which that, um, you know, a painting, bo a painting, a photograph um, born out of a friendship, um, which I think it's absolutely a trace of that friendship and and that kind of collaboration and network of relationships, might also be um, equally attuned to the truth of those objects, right? That there's something quite appropriate for the way that painting is framed in that photograph. And not being a hair expert, although I started to try and find some research, there's really very little written about David Hare. I'm curious if that actually might be a, a rhetorically important way to frame his, his sculpture too. It would seem sort of strange to do a, a photograph about a friendship and patronage and then sort of somehow kind of mangle the works, right? So that it, it would be a kind of seemingly a statement also about the works too. So thank you for clarifying that. So I have a question um, about the two things um, about the varnish. Mm -hmm. One is, if there is such a large implication to varnish, that it makes such a huge difference aesthetically, as I think you've said a couple of times, how is it that nobody noticed in all the years, or did they notice? I, I, I kind of got the impression that this was new knowledge. It seemed surprising if there's huge implication to that fact. Why is that new knowledge after all the work that's been done on the condition of these works? So that's, that's number one. And slightly different question. I think one of you said something about um, that Pollock had applied something like varnish to make the surface harder or, or glue to make it more resistant or something. Is that perhaps more wall-like? Mm. Um, or what, what does that mean, to make it harder or okay. more resistant? Uh, Thank you. Th and to the second one, that is Lee Krasner speaking there. Uh, and uh, that, that is her term. It, it, it would harden the surface, but it, it actually, I think, it would, would have been done to be more receptive uh, to the paint. But I don't think that your reading of it would be what, what she had in mind when she says harden. It's really harden relative to paint taking on the surface or relative to a uh, unsized textile. It's, it's a relative term. And similarly, the answer to, to your first question is relative. It's an overall coding, so those differences um, uh, are what they are as you see them overall. It is a before and after treatment kind of question that uh, we as conservators raise that when you have subtle differences in matte and gloss and then varnish the painting, those get diminished if not entirely lost. But when the painting is presented to you by the artist, 
uh, whatever those once were in the studio, are not there. So the presence of the varnish on uh, number 7, 1949, or any other uh, picture, um, uh, that, that question uh, doesn't arise because it didn't arise for the artist. Um, does that make sense to you? We're, we're, Well, if you had seen the picture before he put it on and after, you would have noticed. But if you only saw it after, you would not have noticed. And our final question over here with Andrew. So I hope this is a question for everybody. And throughout the day, people have been talking about these large paintings as kind of walls. And one thing with the different presentations now I was thinking about is the difference between something like mural a primed canvas that where the composition goes pretty much edge to edge versus the 1950 paintings on unprimed canvas where uh, there's quite a bit of unprimed canvas often at the edges. And just some thoughts about how those function differently. Who wants to? Well, I, I think that uh, here, here I'll just talk about 1A, one, uh, one 1948, and Jen very specifically alluded to it in her talk, or uh, specified it in her talk, that the narrower stretcher presses the picture plane closer to the wall, and it uh, feels as if it is more a part of the wall, or really almost a window out through the wall. Uh, and I think that part of that is having those free edges um, uh, sort of bleed it into the space more, and so it functions in the space that way. That, that, that would be my initial answer to trying to understand that. And that's why I would say efforts that you showed in your talk, Jennifer, of trying to get that brightness back to the, the um, unprimed canvas is, is so important, even though we can't ever get back to that totally, you know, sort of super bright white canvas again. Um, uh, it is fascinating to me, though, to think about this progression from a work like this to these these works, whether it's the Geller mural, which is commissioned for against a color versus against a kind of, you know, these reserve areas and these sort of unprimed canvas areas in, say, number 1A, to the glass paintings. And this idea, it seems to me, that a painting that goes from edge to edge is you know, and this composition aids this, is dealing with unboundedness in, in sort of just out of two edges, sort of like, you know, these edges are open, but these edges are contained, versus, you know, these compositions that are painted all around, they're very centered, right? Even though they're decentered in, in many readings of them, you know, the drip paintings, that is. Um, but then, nevertheless, you do get a sense of him, you know, not completely going off of the rails and some of those super big ones. Now, Full Fathom 5 really does go all the way to the edges, you know, some of the, the sort of somewhat smaller scale. So there's different approaches. There's not a total one way to the, to the, the sort of ground with Pollock's paintings. I wouldn't want to say that. But the big ones like Autumn Rhythm and One and the ones that kept surfacing again and again in a lot of the talks, they do seem to kind of um, start to think about the ground in this much more all in the round way. And then this idea that that ground itself could be transparent and then you see it in a kind of third dimension. It just seems like it, one of the things that struck me as I was trying to think about what mural making might have been for Pollock beyond Benton, the Mexican muralists, and Picasso, right? He's engaging with them, but he's thinking about his own role, would be to think about constantly adding these dimensionalities. Once is a vectoral dimension, once is like all, from all four sides, and then once is flipping in space. So it's not so much to dematerialize or make transparent that ground, it's more offering up different positions of address or different p postures that we could approach it, right? So that, that would be one thing that I would. I just actually had a cool, sorry, just um, I, I, the one thing I do want to ask at one point though is like why the stretcher bar seemed to discolor that, that bare canvas and when you showed the back of, I guess, the black paint. But I'll let Richard answer first and then I want to make sure you. No, you go ahead. Go. Oh, that's just the, the acid migration from the wood okay. to the canvas causes degradation. And but you don't see that on the front unless it sticks there long enough? Or? Eventually, oh, you okay. may see it on the yeah. front, depending Jeez, on how robust the canvas <laughs> Please is. Please get rid of that structure. All right, <laughs> yeah. anyway, go on. Not yet. <laughs> that's what we're trying to prevent. 
I just, um, something I, I took out, but I, I was thinking of, uh, of, my, of my talk, uh, because it was going too long, but uh, that I was thinking about in relation to Megan's presentation, this idea that maybe what a mural does is it constitutes a wall, whether it's on canvas or actually on the wall, and that we think of that as filling the wall in, in some way. I mean, actually post office murals don't always fill the whole wall, but they fill like a space that's clearly mm -hmm. sort of designated as a separate space. And, I, and one thing, I think the painting looks beautiful, but when I saw it, I first saw it in the conservation lab, and it was sort of, as you showed, it sort of propped up, and so in effect, it kind of created a wall. Yeah. Like, I couldn't really see beyond it, and I wasn't really aware of any, you know, of, of the room anymore, because all I was seeing was the painting, and I was, whereas in the gallery, I don't think it functions as a mural any, any yeah, longer. Um, and I know that that was because of also constraints that Getty was working with, but I think these are interesting issues. Do we return it to its original function of constituting a wall, or is that fetishizing too much? These, after yeah. all, it was only four years yes. that it's spent there. It has and, had a long life. And we also just said, I just said, um, one of the things that I would love to see, we were offering up different, like, how should we show this painting? And I'm like, I want it on a pogo wall, like, as if it was at Yale, like some free-floating, you know, kind of screen. Like, the, the, uh, the installation option that we didn't get from having it go to Yale. But that's Great, so answer. on the note of the pogo wall, we're yeah. going to <laughs> well, uh, take, a, take a quick break and have a coffee outside and then reconvene for our last session. Thank you. I would love it.